Welcome to the CEC report. It's January 31. I'm Robert Barwick and I'm with CEC leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome Craig. Yeah, thanks Robbie. In this week's CEC report, destroying SPC Ardmona is the next step to reducing Australia to a quarry. Infrastructure Australia boss Rod Eddington hates maglev, loves tolls, and strategy versus tactics. Only a top-down financial solution can avert a world war. So first, destroying SPC Ardmona is the next step to reducing Australia to a quarry. So Craig, overnight or yesterday, um, the Federal Cabinet made a decision not to inject um, $25 million into the Shepparton um, fruit processor, SPC Ardmona, which has made everyone in Shepparton very worried because it's going to have, if, if SPC goes under, 3,000 people are going to lose their jobs directly, many more indirectly, plus it's a focus for the, the fruit growers in the Goulburn Valley, right, who, who supply the um, cannery, and they're going to have a very, very uncertain future. In fact, many of them are just going to be forced off the land. Now, in the immediate um, term, the, the crisis that's beset SPC Ardmona relates to the high Australian dollar, Right, because what that's done when your dollar goes up, um, you know, its exports have become uncompetitive. At the same time, the high Australian dollar has attract, attracted cheap imports, and they've, the, including dumping. Mm. Now, for those who don't know, dumping is when um, overseas uh, companies will offload stock for l in another country for less than it costs them to produce. Uh, over Christmas, Robbie. Uh, I believe they brought a tariff in on tin tomatoes because there was dumping taking place with basically Italian tin tomatoes coming in. You could buy them off the shelf at the supermarkets for about 53 cents a can. An emergency, so they brought an emergency they, tariff. And about after those stocks ran out, uh, the price went back up to a, over a dollar and nine, which is about the equivalent price for Australian based tomatoes, tin tomatoes in tomatoes. Now, that was to support, that was an emergency tariff that was proven to be dumping and illegal actually, yeah. against World Trade Organization rules. I, I just want to say one thing, Robbie, because this, this sort of shutdown of our industry always upsets me a great deal, but I'm always brought back to the fact that this is not, this is a political fight that which all the viewers out there have to get involved in. Otherwise, they're basically destroying the future of their kids and grandkids. Because what we're fighting is, th this is intended. This is an intentional this is, this fight. Is not this is a religious fight between the dogmas of free trade, which are completely and utterly a religious doc doctrine, uh, and we'll go through a bit more of this. It's a faith-based belief in a, in a so-called market. And why, why? But this is a characteristic of Australians, and I want to go back to what King O'Malley said because this sort of re resonates to anyone who hears this in, in our minds. Yeah. What he said back in the early 20th century, he says, "The Australian is such a lovable fellow, the salt of the earth, so vigorous figure phys physically, but dulled mentally for want of sharpening up with knowledge. How he could expand." What a God-given heritage there is here, but Australians sleep on. If only the people here would realise what they own and what is theirs by the grace of God, trouble as it came to them without a fight. Now he goes on and on. So to the more what and where well you see this with the shutdown of Ford, you see it with the shutdown of Holden, you see it with the shutdown of manufacturing across the board. SBC is just another yeah. result of Australia's sleeping on thinking that oh, our government's going to fix this. Well, one of the things that's lulled Australians, Craig, is this argument that, well, SPC is owned by Coca-Cola, Amatil, uh, you know, Ford and Holden are owned by um, American um, companies, etc. These are just commercial decisions. When the truth is, it comes down to, do we as a country want this kind of capacity, which is a manufacturing capacity, or don't we? Right? Essentially, that's what it is, because you're talking about... Uh, modernisation of a plant up there, $25 million. If 3,000 people are unemployed, Robbie, do the maths, $15,000 yep. a year on the dole, I think it's roughly that. And? 3,000 people. Yeah, well, that's $25 million there. Remember the figures I was banding around with Ford and Holden. Let me put to you, since 2008, the federal government directly purchased mortgage-backed securities in order to keep the sky-high property prices up so that young families cannot afford property and they purchased that to the tune of 20 billion dollars mm. if that 20 if a fraction of that 20 billion dollars went into keeping manufacturing concerns going 
we could keep a lot of our um, these businesses alive. Well, this is what's taking place with this whole doc doctrine of uh, e economic rationalism, free trade, globalisation, the whole that you get rid of national economies. Where you don't want to produce goods. At the end of the day, and we've said it repeatedly, the intention is population reduction. That we've got seven people, seven billion people on the face of this planet. And the intention by the, the ruling British oligarchy, including the Queen and Prince Philip, have said that they want to reduce the world's population down to one billion. This is not some pie-in-the-sky idea. These are the very policies, Robbie, that cause the population reduction. Now, it takes a bit of time. Right? You imagine the amount of time it's taken to build up the factories and the farming areas of SPC up in the Shepparton area. hundred years, basically. A hundred years. Going. Or the entire Murray-Darling Basin. A hundred years, right? And that's being undone in the space, very rapid space, of just a few years. All right. Well, Craig, a couple of weeks ago, we, you and I talked about the Mont Pelerin Society, which you've raised the question of the British Crown. This is a, this is an, a think tank that was set up by the British Crown. It's actually the Economic Warfare Unit of British intelligence, right? Um, and post-war, they set out to revive free trade, free market policies, which, when we talked about it a few weeks ago, we talked about how it was a revival of Mussolini's um, corporativism, aka fascism, right? Well, what I want to do is just give the viewers a sense of how that directly relates to this decision, because there was a, the news reported overnight that the cabinet took a decision, and the cabinet was divided between the dries and the wets. Now, the dries are the economic rationalists, if you understand what that term means. The wets are those few people in the cabinet that are still have a modicum of, pr of being pro-industry about them, right? So, for example, they say that the dries are Joe Hockey and Matthias Corman, the assistant treasurer. The wets are people like um, the industry minister, Ian McFarlane. Ian McFarlane. And um, St. Barnaby, Barnaby Joyce, right? Um, now, Sharman Stone is the member for the area there. She's a Liberal. Um, maybe because we, we bruised her a bit in the Murray-Darling Basin fight, Craig, because, of course, Sharman Stone was happy to so-called defend her constituency on the Murray-Darling Basin issue by putting it all on the, Liberal, on the Labor Party when we pointed out that the act that was shutting it down was an act passed by the Howard government, the Water Act. Well, we painted her in a bit of a corner there she has dropped any pretenses of defending her government on this, and she's come out swinging, which is you know good to see. But um, you know, is it is it going to be enough? Uh, Prime Minister Abbott, when they had this cabinet meeting, three-hour cabinet meeting, he just come back from Davos. Remember at Davos, he preached the gospel, and the gospel was, we should all be missionaries for freer trade. Mm. So coming back from preaching his new gospel, which is an anti-Christian gospel. Because he, he's at odds with the own Pope on this, who's attacking the current free trade global system as a system that kills. Abbott sided with the dries, and so the decision was made, and, and they're not going to support the company. Now, here's what uh, we talk in the headline about this Australia heading to a quarry, mm. right? And I want to explain to people how explicitly this intention is. It just focus on the Liberal Party. This is the party that in 1970, 1969, 1970, under a Liberal government of John Gordon, passed a bill setting up the Australian Industry Development Corporation and the intention of that, of that institution was to fund secondary industries, the development of secondary industries, so that raw materials could be processed in Australia and not exported as raw materials overseas, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we could have a, secondary, a strong secondary industry. That was their commitment and they shared that with a lot of um, Labor guys. Well, uh, fast forward to 1979. In 1979, Margaret Thatcher just got elected, and she was a product of this Mont Pelerin Society in England. Mm -hmm. And in England, their, front, their group there is called the Institute of Economic Affairs. And in Australia, the members of the Mont Pelerin Society, and it's, it, was, it was always been kept fairly secret until we exposed it in the 90s. So this were people like John Hyde, a Liberal MP from WA, um, Morris Newman, one of the real sort of eminence grease uh, shady characters around the Liberal Party, very influential businessman, and Greg Lindsay, who's an academic in Sydney, they're all members of the Mont Pelerin Society, they decided Australia should have its own version of this Institute of Economic Affairs in London that had been successful in getting Thatcher in place. And they chose this group that Greg Lindsay had set up called the Centre for Independent Studies. And he'd been operating it out of his backyard since 1976. And the kinds of things they did was they would bring people like Milton Friedman to Australia to lecture members of parliament or 
um, Friedrich von Hayek himself and other guru of the Mont Pelerin Society to lecture members of parliament on a total free trade world, right? Well, in 1979, Greg Lindsay hit the jackpot because all of a sudden he was given enormous corporate funding to, to effectively be the, 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 the headquarters to launch a revolution in the Liberal Party. And I want to point out who the funding came from. So six companies agreed to put up $5,000 a year for five years to this, to this think tank, the Centre for Independent Studies. And those six companies are Western Mining Corporation, CRA, Consinc Rio Tinto Australia, BHP, Shell, Santos, and the Advertiser. Now, the odd one out, of course, is the Advertiser, the advertiser. but it's not really the odd, odd one out because it's Rupert Murdoch's company, the, the Adelaide newspaper. But those other five companies are all raw materials exporters, right? And that is a big part of their agenda. These free trade people see Australia as a place where we're not going to do secondary industry. We're just going to rip it out of the ground and send it off overseas, and we're going to, and Australia is going to become a quarry. And they are explicit on that idea. And the way Paul, they, they recruited, they took over the Liberal Party. People like John Howard got involved, and you know, eventually they took it over. They called it a revolution in the Liberal Party. They infiltrated the Labor Party. Bob Carr, Paul Keating's good buddy, Bob Carr, is a famous member of the Centre for Independent Studies. Paul Keating, the way he put it, he put it in this um, economic jargon theoretical jargon. And what he said when he became treasurer is that Australia should concentrate on its comparative advantages. And that's economic speak, that you should only just do what you're good at. And that is exporting minerals, wheat, wool and beef, i.e. raw materials, unprocessed, and the rest of the industry in Australia was on its own. If it survived, well and good, but there was no commitment to that anymore. Right, and this came out of this Mont Pelerin Society revolution that was launched here in the late 1970s and early 1980s. So, Craig, knowing that, with that history to it, what do you say to those wets in the Abbott government, people like Sharman Stone and Barnaby Joyce, who think they want to save SPC? Then, well, they're on the right track in a sense, Robbie, but look, one of the things they can do is, first of all, put a tariff on imported fruit. Very simple, very simple piece of legislation. Put a tariff, increase the cost of you know, fruit inside Australia for anything that's imported. That would help the industry to start with and stop the dump dumping laws. It's the very first thing. But look, you're talking about overturning an entire economic doctrine here. And that's going to require people have got courage, people that are prepared to stand up and say, this is killing our people. Yep. It's going to kill our people in the long run because we're talking about, you know, literally, what, you've got 3,000 people affected by this decision. How many of those are going to suicide out of desperation? Now, Sharman Stone knows that. She's in that mm. their backyard. So the point is we've got to dump these policies to free trade and globalisation, go with policies of real economic development, supporting local manufacturers through the Commonwealth Bank, which is what King O'Malley set up in the first place, and bring in export controls like tariffs and get rid of the, the entire monetarism and stop having the dollar, which is like in the casino. Well, just on what you said on the Commonwealth Bank, it occurred to me they're telling the farmers now that they, you know, they don't necessarily have to shut up shop. You know, they should invest in um, in, in um, turn, re reviewing their capacity so they can export on their own, export fresh fruit and vegetables, do all that. In other words, not be, not fi not see themselves as feeding SPC, but go off on their own, right? But that requires money for investment, and of course, the farmers are saying, "Where are we going to get that money from?" And one of the byproducts of the current financial system, Craig, is banks. Uh, have all the incentives in the world to lend into the property bubble, mm -hmm. but hardly any to lend into, you know, agriculture. Right? It, uh, banks don't like doing; they want to pull their money out of agriculture. The only way that the solution they're offering farmers can be achieved is if you had a national bank like the Commonwealth Bank that can provide that kind of credit. That's right, Robbie. I mean, the point is that the, the Commonwealth Bank actually played that role during the war to stop profiteering. I said before. Look, there's a lot of things here that yeah. could be done. The bottom line is that we need a complete change and people have got the guts to stand up and fight for it. All right, well, we'll leave it at that. When we come back, we're going to talk about maglev trains. Welcome back to the CEC report. Frankston to Melbourne Airport in 20 minutes via maglev. Why does Infrastructure Australia boss Rod Eddington hate it? 
So, Craig, we're doing the, the new government has an agenda, which is they're big on infrastructure, right? Got to have infrastructure, which is good. Yeah, we of course you've got to have infrastructure, but it's a store, you know, a, um, a, a, a Trojan, Trojan horse policy. to um, actually be the excuse to pri mass privatise everything and create privatised infrastructure, you know, public-private partnerships, etc. So what we're doing is we're, we're starting to discover the true colours of, the, of these people involved. And what you find around Australia and the bureaucracies, you have these key appointments of big business guys that have got important jobs who get to influence this. And one of the biggest is Sir Roderick Eddington. Now, um, those who... People in Melbourne would understand, and those who might have followed the news, there's a bit of controversy in Melbourne at the moment about building an east-west tunnel, link the east side to the to the western infrastructure, and they want to build it under the city, and there's big protests. That idea came out of a, a report that Sir Rod Eddington um, put out in 2008, right, where he advocated it at, at a cost of $8 billion to be funded through tolls, mm. right? Big surprise. Well, what we want to highlight is in reaction to that, Tyson Krupp Transrapid Australia, which is the Australian subsidiary of the, of the Tyson Transrapid company in Germany, which developed magnetically levitated trains, they said, why haven't you looked at the alternatives? And what they said was, they put forward a proposal that they build a double-tracked magnetically levitated train from Frankston, which is way down on the end of the bay, to the Melbourne airport. So that would cut through the whole population um, density of Melbourne, right? And the trip with stops would take 20 minutes. And there would be no um, uh, tunnels, because it, the, the, the guideways are elevated above the roads, and so they're easy to construct even through the, bit, the densest CBD. And they said it could cost $4 billion, mm. or half of what Eddington um, proposed. Now, you and I know, Craig, that would have a huge impact on the, the, the traffic density in Melbourne. If people, there's so much traffic that goes that has to cover, travel through the city every day to the airport, because there's no railway link to the airport anyway. If people got to go to a, a junction point connecting to this maglev train close to where they are, especially in the eastern suburbs, you would take a lot of you know traffic off the road, right? But Eddington, no way. Turns out Rod Eddington hates it. He hates maglev trains. He calls it quote speculative technology with fuzzy economics. Now, why would that be? Well, it turns out that Sir Rod Eddington loves tolls, right? More than anything else, he loves infrastructure that can be tolled. And it got so far that in 2006, he was, given a, he, he was appointed by the British government to, do a, to look into their transport problems. His solution to their transport problems was introducing a pay-as-you-drive system in England of up to a £1.28 per mile which would see motorists paying as much as £25 per day just to go to work. And he thought that was a brilliant idea and he called it a no-brainer. Who is Rod Eddington? Craig, he's the chairman of JP Morgan. He's the director of News Corporation. He's the former director of Rio Tinto and ANZ. And he's on the board of this same Centre for Independent Studies we were just talking about in the previous um, segment. So my question to you is, unlike Rod Eddington, Craig, you are not a vested interest. He obviously is. What do you think of TransRapid's well, proposal I'm best for interest in the, the best interest of the country, Robbie. And the point is if we had a national bank, the former Commonwealth Bank, funding infrastructure, we should have a network of high-speed, modern, TransRapid-type trains. Not just within net, uh, Melbourne, but within the, the other regional, uh, the other s yeah. capital cities, but also between the capital cities. And we've written a lot about this in our infrastructure development program for Australia, you know, Road to Recovery. And funded by a national bank. This, this, yeah, is, look, this would be quite cheap. This is a cash cow for the private banking system, and they're doing it to prop up the, the, cr the, the, the crumbling and crashing system now. And they're eager to get their hands on the taxpayer to, uh, or, or the ordinary citizen to pay and bail them out. Well, we're, and you're right, you're right saying taxes because effectively we're paying taxes to private interests. Yeah. And that's how the system will work. Yeah. Anyway, we're going to keep on this theme because this is the big agenda of the Liberal government, so watch this space. But we're out of time. When we come back, we're going to have an important discussion about strategy versus tactics as the way to think about stopping a global war. <laughs> Welcome back to the CEC report. Finally, strategy versus tactics. Only a top-down financial solution can avert a world war. 
For Craig, if you look around the world right now, there are numerous hotspots and they're all very dangerous because they all have the potential to spark something much bigger, right? I become a trigger for a global war. There's the Anglo-American sponsored uprising in Ukraine and that's what it is, right? It's a subversive attempt to, infra to um, subvert the Ukraine government, um, all backed by the Anglo-Americans. You've got the dicey negotiations over Syria and Iran, mm. and they're right on the edge as well, right? Because you've got interests on both sides that would want a war. You've got a pretty dangerous situation in North Korea at the moment, right? Because there's a lot of uncertainty around the, um, the new regime of the Kim the Third, and the uncertainty relates to not even China has much of an insight into what's going on. China's main negotiation partner there is the guy that this Kim just took, you know, knocked off, right? So what approach is required to stop these crises and others like them spiraling into a larger conflict that can erupt into a thermonuclear war? Probably you can, the, this is the 100th year of the anniversary of First World War, 1914, right? And the point, at that point, that war was in part driven by the collapse of the banking system at that point. That's what we're looking at again today. There's been numerous reports coming out to say, look, the various banks are on the edge of collapse. HSBC is one of them. You see various reports coming out. Now, the point is that top down, we need a Glass-Steagall, an international Glass-Steagall approach, which means a re-regulation of the entire global banking system. Mr. LaRouche used to refer to it as a new Bretton Woods system, but it's the same idea, which whereby every country introduces legislation to separate out the commercial banking system, the legitimate trading banking systems that you need for commerce, from the speculative mega banks uh, operations in investment and, and very risky merchant banking. You've got $1.5 quadrillion of derivatives turnovers, which are completely speculative type gambling debts uh, in the banking system, which is driving the, the, the incessant need for the banks to bail themselves out. Mm. You have qualitative easing in the United States with the printed trillions of dollars to literally give it to the banks in order to try and keep them afloat. That's all going to stop and you've got to go back through a glass dig and say, no, the power of government has to step in here. We are going to regulate the banking system. We're going to get rid of the bad aspect of the bank. Let me go bankrupt. We don't care, but we're going to keep a strong commercial banking system with those banks that aren't involved in this. And we're going then going to fund large-scale infrastructure development like the maglev trade systems through national credit, through national banking, to put people back into work and to regenerate the economy. And you think about that from Australia's point of view. Immediately, it would be a no-brainer. If Coca-Cola Amatol doesn't want to do the right thing by SPC, the government would step in and take it over. Just mm. take it over, right? Look, SPC right now will just leave this country. You know, $200 billion for a multinational like that is nothing if they think they're going to keep losing money. They'll just go into China or increase their, their assets in, um, in other yep. parts of the world. So they'll just dump Australia. And who wins? We lose, right? So you've got to change that approach if you're going to address this financial crash drive. Wherever you have private corporations, including banks, that are operating on the basis of private shareholder profit, you immediately have a tension between that and what we stand for, which is the idea of the nation state that stands up for the idea of the common good or the general welfare. Now, this principle has been stomped on and destroyed by the Mont Pelerin Society in the psyche of a lot of Australians in the last 40 years. We represent the only organisation that's been fighting for it. And that's why I said before, people should wake up because we're having tremendous opportunities here. King O'Malley saw it, but unless we do, we are a dead nation. Yep, and it has global, like most other countries in the world, they're going down the same path. Yep. All right, well, thanks very much, Craig. That's it for this week's CEC Report. Thanks for tuning in, and tune in next week for more.